for your presence. Thank you for being with us tonight. Some of you, we just get to see you at Christmas because you're home for the holiday, and so we are grateful to God for your presence. Since the last time I've seen you, whoo, what a year it's been, huh? You have to admit that we've had very little experience of peace. Certainly, we don't live in a peaceable kingdom. The nation is divided in a way that we have not seen in our lifetimes. Everything seems to be broken down into faction, factions and parts and groups. It's so serious that I need to make light of it, at least for a moment tonight, before we get into the meaty readings that we have. There was a lady in the Midwest who uh, was making a special trip to the post office because she wanted a, a special holiday stamp, you know, the really Christian stamp that went on the holiday cards. And the postal clerk, after listening to her request for the really religious Christmas stamp to go on her Christmas cards, said, well, um, what denomination? And the lady said, good heavens, has it come to that? Well, give me 50 Baptists and 50 Ref uh, Reformed Church. Sadly, however, things are far more serious than that, aren't they? We've had to be reminded that, that black lives matter, that blue lives matter, that lives matter, that women are not the objects of sexual assault. So bad that we have to state the obvious? Mass shootings are commonplace in our nation, and we can't seem to get a handle on them to stem them at all. While church attendance is on a steady decline in the U.S., white supremacy membership is surging, Neo-Nazis are on the rise. What's happening? The stream weather has become almost normal. Hurricanes have devastated the Gulf Coast, the Caribbean, our protectorate, the U.S. protectorate, Puerto Rico, still doesn't have full electricity months after the storm. Still closer, a fire that started on December 5th still rages on, claiming buildings and lives in our county, in our neighborhoods, in our wider community. All of this, and I haven't even really mentioned politics or terrorism, or nuclear threats, or unrest in the rest of the world. No matter what our politics are tonight, we all have to admit that something is really wrong. Confessing that peace is broken, we gather to welcome the Prince of Peace. But we, like the ancient ones, have failed to keep the covenant of equity and justice with creation, our neighbors, and with God. The voice of the prophets, Isaiah 3, 13 through 15. God entered into judgment against the leaders of Israel. It is you who have ruined the lands, you who have robbed the poor to fill your pockets. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the faces of the poor, declares the Lord. The voice of the prophets, Zechariah chapter 7. This is what the Lord God says. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the orphan, the foreigner, the alien in your land or the poor. In your hearts do not think evil of each other. But they, the people, refused to pay attention. Stubbornly they turned their backs and stopped up their ears to the law or to the words that the Lord Almighty had sent through earlier prophets. So the Lord was very angry with Israel. When I called, the Lord Almighty said, they did not listen. So when they call, neither shall I listen. The people will be scattered among the nations where they will be treated like aliens and strangers. The land was left desolate behind them so that no one would come or go. This is how they made the pleasant land desolate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. All-powerful and unseen God, the coming of your light into our world has brightened weary hearts with peace. Call us out of darkness and empower us to proclaim the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, and give us the will and steadfastness to live into his promises and his commands. This we ask in the name of the same, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We sing together. Christ be our light. Thank you. 
The Voice of the Prophets, a promise of a peaceable kingdom, from Isaiah 11. A shoot shall come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. He will judge the needy rightly. With justice he will decide for the poor of the earth. Righteousness and faithfulness he will wear like a belt around his waist. And then the wolf will live, lie down with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child shall lead them. No one will be harmed or destroyed there, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. The voice of the promised Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9. There will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, the land of Zebulun and Naphtali were humbled, but the future God will honor Galilee, filled with foreigners, Galilee of the Gentiles. By the way of the sea, along the Jordan River, the people walking in darkness will have seen a great light. On those living in the land of death, light has dawned. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hearing the, pro hearing the promise of God's peaceable kingdom. The book of Titus, chapter 3. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of any work of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This spirit he poured on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, 
we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is sure. I desire that you insist on these things so that those who have come to believe in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable to everyone. But avoid stupid controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. After the first and second admonition, have nothing more to do with a divisive person, since you know that such a person is warped and sinful and is self-condemned. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. to invite the kids that are here tonight to come forward for our children's message with Avery Mansman. Be gentle to her. This is her first children's time. <laughs> Try not to tie her knots. So, does anyone have uh, pets at home? Yeah. Is he? I have a dog. What's its name? Bogey. Do you have a pet? I have a dog named Augie. Augie. So, Jesus also had um, animals at when he was born. And so, did these pets ever like comfort you when you had a really bad day, or like you didn't get a good grade on the test, or you mm. got hurt? Uh, by a friend, or did you just not have a good day and your dog uh, comfort you? So the animals comfort Jesus when he was cold in the manger, and so um, so the animals helped him um, be warm and comfort him. Uh, even though she was being born, he they were there for him. So I have little animal crackers to represent uh, the animals that help Jesus. So I will be passing those out. And then in there is a passage, and you'll either get a fluffy sheep or a little gray cow, a uh, donkey. And give it to your brother there. Um, and so, does anyone want, if anyone has a donkey, does anyone want to read that? Okay. <coughs> the lowly donkey carried Mary on his back across the hills. He carried her no courage did he laugh. So, the gray donkey carried Mary, which helped Jesus get um, to the manger. And he was always brave. And does anyone have the fluffy sheep? Fluffy sheep were where where they where they on the night of joy and love where the heavenly Father sent his son from the heavens home above. So yes, the um, sheep was there um, when God um, brought Jesus down, our Savior, and brought him down to love us and um, take care of us. And this reminds us that God loves us no matter what. And it doesn't matter if we're having a bad day or uh, if we are uh, happy or sad or uh, lonely. He just loves us no matter what. Want to say anything? The word of the Lord. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Way to go. High five. <laughs> Nicely done, Avery. I didn't take the opportunity to say anything because I have a great big opportunity to say a whole lot. So, all right. So you probably know this story fairly well. But let's hear it again. Maybe picture it in your mind, or maybe see it in your mind like a movie. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. 
all went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken the place which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph, and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told to them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God.
Beautiful choir, nicely done. We got a big choir tonight. Nice to see all of you. Thanks for singing with us and singing for us and joining the choir here on Christmas Eve. We're grateful for it. It is a night of uh, drama, of course. Uh, not that every week isn't full of drama, but it's sort of a special sort of time, isn't it? It's a magical time for, for children. As I joined them at the playground over here, they were having a chat about when Santa was coming and who got an email from Santa already and that they'd already seen the CNN report about the sleigh. So there's a lot of excitement, at least on this side of the room. I, if you guys can hold it down, that would be awesome. Uh, but it does sort of shoot like a movie. If you, it is one of those things. I mean, there's another movie, an animation out, uh, The Star. Uh, it's, it shoots like a movie. And so if you can see it that way, I think it, it pictures itself well. Luke tells a, a story, kind of shooting the opening picture of Christ's nativity with, with this sort of well, wide, wide lens, taking a step far back, going out about as far as he can to the historical context by naming the emperor and the governor. And then, narrowing in, the shot just starts to move, move ever so close. And you realize it can't get much more tight in a shot until finally it's in on something that no emperor or governor would ever have noticed an unwed teenage mother, homeless at least for this evening, getting by in a makeshift shelter of a barn, giving birth to her first child, attended only by her husband-to-be and by some local shepherds. It's kind of absurd when you think about it. It's absurd in its smallness. How can Luke imagine that this birth matters, let alone warrants being placed on a stage alongside an imperial census and other matters of state? You know the census was for, right? Taxation. Christmas gifts still abound at Christmas time. Taxation still seems to be the theme. The story is ironic it, in this juxtaposition of the grand, the majestic, and the meager. However, Luke's witness to the irony, even the absurdity of the events we celebrate this night, that God, the creator, the ruler, the sustainer of the cosmos would, would not only notice us, our ups and our downs, our dreams and our disappointments, our triumphs and our tragedies, but would also care enough about us to take them on becoming one of us, one with us. The story is also not only ironic, it's fitting. The prophets of old, that's why we read to you from some of the prophets, have told us how to have a peaceable way of life, a peaceable society, or as our theme in Advent was, the peaceable kingdom, to care for widows and orphans, the foreigner and the poor. And so it is fitting that God would enter the world through a person in need, a poor person, without proper shelter, subject to the government's whims that night, victim of the Pax Romana, which was more often a brutal way to keep peace than anything, a peace that would line the pockets of the elite with taxation of the residents of the nation of Israel, a conquered nation. 
And so Luke's grand opening scene, this quick turn to a simple, even kind of homely story, presents the good news of God in a little nutshell, that the immortal and all-powerful God does not shy away from the ordinary, the finite, even the mundane creatures like us, but rather draws near, eager to embrace us like a lover too long separated from the beloved. The implications of the nativity are astounding. Through God's embrace of our lot and our lives, we learn about God. We learn that God is love, eager to be with us. We learn that God will not give up on us. We learn that there is no length or depth to which God will not go to reach out to us, no matter where we've gone. We also learn something about ourselves, and indeed about the whole creation. We learn that we have worth that we all have dignity, that we and the whole creation is of great value to God, a God who would enter it as a part of creation. We learn that all those around us are treasured as children of God. God came to dwell in ordinary human flesh, in this way, making it holy, holy with all creation. And so set the pattern for us to similarly honor each other and the whole created order, what we've called the peaceable kingdom. We learn that God elevates and infuses importance to those persons and circumstances of the world that the world deems insignificant, that the world sees as worthless. There will be many who gather this evening who had a pretty good year and are blessed and grateful for a good year, for, for health, for good health, for the love of family and friends. And so on this night, you might hear this news, this story, this birth again as a God who joins you in your gladness for the blessings and promises that you have that you are encouraged to use for the benefit of those around you. This is what it means to live into God's desire that we would be a peaceable kingdom, that we have responsibility in all the gifts that God has given to us. But God also knows something greater or maybe something more. As the world keeps looking at leaders and the world stage, God knows that most of the world is not like Emperor Augustus, that the broad, broad lens of Governor Quirinius is not where most of the world is, or even that of Queen Elizabeth or Prime Minister Trudeau or President Trump. And there will be many gathering this night in sanctuaries like this one all over the world who have put, had to put on a joyous face to hide the pain and the uncertainty and the fear that they feel. And on this night, this story may speak to you as well, this God being born in the history story, that God longs to know your struggle, that God stands with you and for you, and God will not let you go. And of course, there, there are the many of us who come, perhaps most of us, who are, are holding some tension between these two things, right, of, of some joy and some sorrow, of some hope and some fear, all together mixed up in our hearts. And, we're all together on that night, like the shepherds, you know, just minding their business, you know, got the good news of great joy given to them, right smack dab in the middle of their jobs, right in the middle of their shift. They're honored with God's unexpected attention. They're greeted with this good news, and they have to wait till their shift ends to say, well, let's go check this out. What is this good news? What's this sign about a baby in a, in a food trough? Let's, let's go see what this is about. And they will bear witness to others because God interrupted their lives mixed with joy and sorrow, hope and fear. This witness of our Savior comes to us in a couple ways, I think. First, we strive as Christians to live the values of the prophets and the apostles and indeed of Christ. To do these two simple things, to stay in right relationship with God and to keep right relationship with our neighbor by a way of seeking equity for them, by offering compassion to them, by seeking justice for them, by protecting what is theirs and providing for their needs. This is the design of the peaceable kingdom, the theme that we've been carrying out in these last four Sundays of Advent, and it carries over, of course, to tonight. But tonight we recognize, as I said earlier, that there is something really wrong in our world, 
and that the peaceable kingdom or that society certainly does not exist robustly, if at all. So on this night, on this Christmas Eve, we remember how God entered our world, and we can know that God has sent us a Savior to do that for which we could not do for ourselves. He's come to set us free from sin and death and to free us to live for him. And as we study his life, that's what we do in the church, we study his life, we come to know how to live into a peaceable life and a peaceable society as much as it is up to us with others. And we're honest with ourselves, right? I mean, and with others that no utopian experiment has ever survived human willfulness and our self-interest of greed. And in studying human history, we come to understand that we need God to save us. So tonight, we recognize both in this Christmas, our striving for a peaceable, just society and God's ultimate gift of salvation. There's good news in both those things. I want to cheer you on in both of those things, in your striving for something and in being saved from something. But what God has done for us in Christ, as the angel said, is a good news of great joy that is for all people, of a Savior who has come to help us and to stand with us, especially when we cannot do it for ourselves. One who has come to lift up the broken and the poor, to mend grieving hearts, and finally, to raise the dead. And so tonight, we celebrate and we adore the Savior, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, who has come. Amen.